So welcome to my talk on microservices and, and domain-driven design, or specifically aggregates. And the goal is really to show how the concept of aggregate is super useful when you're building business logic or business applications using the microservice architecture. And it turns out that the applicability of domain-driven design to microservices is much, much broader than what I'm talking about. There's other concepts that are sort of out of scope for this presentation, like bounded contexts and various sort of strategic design concepts from DDD. Um, but in this talk, I'm just focusing on, 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 the, on this concept of an aggregate. So before I get into that, a little bit about me. So if you don't know me, I'm Chris Richardson. I actually live in Oakland, um, California. Got my start in programming back in the mid 80s, building Lisp systems. So compilers, everything from runtimes, compilers, garbage collectors, all the way up the stack to IDEs. Eventually, I ended up programming in Java. Um, and then you know, 10 years ago, sort of a lifetime ago, my book, Pojo's in Action, came out. And that was all about Spring and Hibernate, which 10 years ago were these technologies that were absolutely revolutionizing enterprise Java development. And it's super cool that 10 years later, you know, Spring is, is still innovating and, and still extremely relevant. So I'm super excited about that. And then back in 2006, um, 2007, I started playing around with what was then a very obscure service known as Amazon EC2. I think this was before even the term cloud computing had, had been developed. And a, a, an evangelist from Amazon came and spoke at my local jug, and we thought they were going to talk about APIs for buying books, because that's what Amazon was known for 10 years ago. And instead, it was APIs for provisioning servers. And the concept that you could just do that blew my mind, so much so that I created an open source project which evolved into a startup called Cloud Foundry, um, the name of which is somewhat um, famous today. Um, they're a different technology. So my Cloud Foundry, the classic version, which was a PaaS for deploying Java applications on AWS, was acquired by Spring Source, which was then acquired by VMware, and then I ended up being at VMware and then Pivotal for some number of years, and ended up leaving almost, I suppose, three years ago now. So since then, I've been focusing on this area of microservices. So I do consulting and training for, with micro, for, about microservices, and I'm also a founder of a startup, and we're building a platform to simplify the development of business applications that use microservices. And in fact, some of the concepts I'm going to cover today are supported by our product. If you want to know more about microservices in general, then go to this link, learnmicroservices.io, and there you'll find links to blog posts, articles, presentations, videos, example code, that I've, and, and also training that I've created over the years. So, so the, the one go-to place. So that, that's sort of me. Um, so here's the agenda. So first off, I want to talk, sort of provide the motivation for the rest of the talk by describing the kinds of problems that you will encounter when you're implementing business logic using the domain model pattern in a, in a microservice architecture. And then after that, I'm going to talk all about aggregates and how they, they solve those problems. So let's get going. So first, a little bit about microservices, which you know, just everybody's talking about them today. So I'm just going to touch on them really, really briefly. And just to say that first and foremost, the, the goal of the microservice architecture is to tackle the complexity of large applications. And the way, of course, that it does that is by using the ancient technique of modularization. So in other words, it takes what would otherwise be a large monolithic application and breaks it up into a set of smaller applications which go by the name of services. And it really is just a form of modularization. Each, mo each microservice corresponds to a business capability, which is something a business does in order to create value. 
So if you apply that sort of thinking to an online store, you would end up with an architecture that looked like this, right? You'd have various services corresponding to different business capabilities, like the catalog service that's maintaining product catalog information, the review service that's keeping track of reviews, the order service that's responsible for processing orders, and, and, and so on. So we're just breaking the application up into these miniature, into these mini applications. Each service has its own database, which is absolutely necessary in order to ensure loose coupling. And, but in, at the same time, that's a double-edged sword, because that's going to lead, that actually is the, sort of the ultimate, the, the root cause of many of the problems that, are, that have motivated this, this um, presentation. So keep that in mind. Each service has its own database. And then, of course, sitting in front of the services, you're going to have an API gateway that's acting as a facade, providing a single entry point into the system of microservices, and possibly doing, providing a dedicated API to each particular kind of client. And then you've got various clients that are consuming those microservices. Could be a web application, could be a, um, a mobile application. And each of these services, you can scale independently. Um, but that's sort of out, out of the scope of this discussion. And so services enforce modularity because they have a very well-defined boundary. Um, so a, a service is a process, that ultimately. And everything that is inside a process is private to that process unless it has been explicitly exposed through an API, whether that could be REST or messaging. So it's just a very, very strong form of modularity something that's been really difficult to achieve inside programming languages, right? Like Java packages are just not good for, for building truly modular systems. OSGI attempts to do that, but I guess we all know how well that succeeded, right? Um, except, you know, in general with, amongst application developers. So that's a microservice architecture. So it enables you to develop faster and build more modular applications that are higher quality and faster and so on. But there are, there are a whole set of challenges with the, the microservice architecture. And in this talk, I'm just going to focus on, some very, on a couple of very narrow, specific issues that, it, that sort of impact how you implement um, your business logic. So the first problem you're going to encounter is that your typical domain model, right? Because everyone knows that you know, if you're building complex business logic, you should apply the domain model pattern and build objects with rich structure and rich behavior. The problem you run into is a typical domain model is really just a tangled web of classes. Inside a monolithic application, there's actually problems with that in itself. But there's some real problems with that in a microservice architecture, because ultimately, you want to be able to put different classes in different microservices, right? But objects point to one another. So orders would have a reference to its customer. Order line items have a reference to the corresponding product. So when you want to put the order object inside the order service, it's going to have the order object itself is going to have this pointer to a customer. What does that mean when it's going across the service boundary? Right? That, that just does not compute. Likewise, with the reference from order line item to product. So that's one problem. A typical domain model cannot easily be partitioned in, across multiple services. The second problem you're going to run into is that a typical Java application is just going to rely on ACID transactions to enforce invariance, you know, enforce business rules. So in this particular domain model, customers have a credit limit. So when you place a new order, you have to verify that the, that the new order won't exceed the credit limit. In a monolithic application, that's, tr that's trivial. You begin a transaction. You find the existing orders. You find the credit limit for that customer. You make sure that you haven't exceeded the credit limit, and you might abort at this point. And then you insert an order, and then you commit the transaction. And assuming that you're using the right isolation level, 
the serializable property of asset transactions will enforce that business rule even if there are multiple simultaneous transactions trying to create orders for the same customer. Those, the, the, the sort of the transaction manager will in, will in essence serialize those transactions so they, they appear to happen one after the other. Um, so that, that's, a, that's a really nice, simple programming model, right? You know, we're just used to it and there's a lot of power. But the problem you have with that approach is that, first of all, it violates encapsulation. Remember, each service has its own database. So the order table belongs to the order service. The customer table belongs to the customer service. So you can't access both of them within the same transaction, you're violating the encapsulation um, of each service. So that's one problem. The other problem you have is that this transaction would, would actually span multiple services. And that, of course, would require some form of distributed transaction mechanism or two-phase you know, two commit mechanism. And it turns out that in modern applications, 2PC is not a viable option. On the one hand, it does give you some kind of consistency guarantees, though you actually have to read the fine print to see what kind of isolation level it gives you. But because it comes with a whole lot of complexity and issues, it's generally best avoided in modern applications. It's not supported by, a, by many modern technologies like NoSQL databases or, or modern message brokers. So even if you wanted to use it, you couldn't. And then also there's the CAP theorem, right, which basically says you have consistency, availability, and partitioning, and you have to pick two of those. And today it's preferable to pick availability over consistency. So there's sort of a theoretical sort of issue with, with using two-phase commit in modern applications. So we sort of have a problem. This just sort of just this transaction model just doesn't fit the kinds of technologies and the kinds of systems that we're building today. So that's a problem. And then in particular, it doesn't fit the capabilities of most NoSQL databases, which, have, which tend to have a very, very limited sort of mo transaction model. Basically, you can update one record, whether that's a document or a row or a key value pair, in a, in a typical NoSQL database. You don't have full asset um, transaction sort of semantics there. So there's sort of a problem taking the traditional way with which we build applications or with which we write business logic to be precise and translating that to the modern world of microservices and SQL databases. Um, so yeah, so that, that's the problem. So what, what's the solution? So it turns out that many of the solutions to the problems that we have when we're building microservice-based applications can be found in domain-driven design, which is kind of funny because this book was written you know, like 13 years ago. So it's sort of this ancient text as far as software development goes, which is very philosophically motivated but it turns out that it actually has the solutions to building very, very modern, modern applications, which is quite, quite ironic in a way. So let's dig into that a little more. So, and probably many of us have read, you know, started reading some of the book, right? And it talks about the building blocks of, of, of domain models, right? There's the concept of an entity that's an object that has a persistent ID. There's the idea of a value object that just sort of has value but no identity. There's the concept of services that contain business logic that don't actually belong anywhere or don't belong in entities or value objects. And then, of course, there, there's the concept of repositories that um, really are just abstractions over collections of entities that are living in a database. And we've all pretty much internalized those, right? You know, that, the, the, perhaps maybe not value objects as much, even though they're incredibly valuable, but we're all used to using terms like entity, service, and repository. You know, even frameworks today support that, right? Um, so that, the, the, at least the first four have entered sort of modern 
kind of our dictionary. But then there's the last one, which is aggregates, which when I read the book, you know, back in 2004, 2005, it was like, yeah, 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 whatever, and I kind of ignored it and just focused on entities and value objects, services, and repositories. But it turns out that aggregates are absolutely essential a concept to apply when you're building business logic in a microservice application. So what is an aggregate? So an aggregate is a cluster of objects that can be treated as a unit. So it's, it's sort of a graph that has a root entity and possibly one or more other value objects or entities that are just sort of referenced by the root, either directly or indirectly. So it's a little cluster of objects that just reference one another. And it turns out that most sort of business entities like order, customer, account, product, etc., really actually are aggregates. We sort of think of them as entities, but really, you know, like in the case of an order, yeah, there's an order object, but that's not really the whole order, right? That an order also has line items. And it also might have a payment address and a, a delivery address and so on, possibly payment info as well. So, you know, so we have an order aggregate and, and it is this cluster of objects. So it's actually this way of taking a, our domain model and breaking it up into chunks that can be treated as a unit. You know, among other things, it actually says, it actually defines what it means to delete an order, right? So when you delete an order, you have to delete the line items and the address and, and, and so on. Um, so that's just number first benefit. It actually breaks a domain model up into chunks. And any time you can modularize your domain model, that's quite good. But there's actually some deeper meaning to it than that. So there's a set of rules that aggregates have to obey. And the first rule concerns how one aggregate can reference another. So, you, can, you know, an order, for instance, can have a rec would want to reference a customer, right, which is, which is itself another aggregate. But what's really interesting here is that rather than having an object reference to the customer, it actually just has the primary key. Um, uh, of, of the customer. So an order would, would not have a customer field, but it would have a customer ID field. Likewise, an order line item would have a product ID field and not just a product field that would be a pointer to the, uh, to the, um, to the product object. And it's sort of like, wait, what? what? You know, you can't have foreign keys in object models, right? You know, if you were to go back and look at a text on object-oriented design, foreign keys in your domain model would be considered a code smell and should be removed instantly. So we're actually sort of violating some of the tradi a very traditional uh, a rule in very traditional object-oriented design. But the benefit of this is that not only have we modularized the domain model, which is good, the actual chunks, the actual aggregates are very loosely connected now, right? Because it's just in terms of primary key and not a proper object reference. So that makes it really easy in many ways to actually put the order in the order service, the customer in the customer service, and the product in the product service, because there are no object references that are, that are attempting to span process boundaries. So, in other words, aggregates let you partition your object model across microservices. So that's a good thing. So that, that's one immediate benefit. There's also another rule, which when I sort of read it for the very first time, like made no sense whatsoever. And the idea and the rule is, is that a transaction should only create or update one aggregate. Um, so in other words, sort of an aggregate is kind of a unit of consistency. Um, and that, that sort of shocked me as well because, you know, back then I was using my relational database inside my monolithic application. I could begin a transaction, update as much data as I want, and then commit the transaction, and I'd I sort of have wonderful guarantees. 
And now there's someone who's saying, right, Eric Evans is saying, no, no, a transaction has to be limited in scope. And it was sort of like, well, that's silly. It's not properly leveraging the technology that, that we have available. But, you know, you could think back to one of the problems with, with microservices and databases, right? A transaction has to fit within a, within a service. We can't use distributed transactions in order to span service boundaries. And so this constraint on what our transactions can do inside our business logic exactly fits the technical constraints that we have inside a microservice architecture. So now, because an aggregate is contained within a service and a transaction can only update or create a single aggregate, a transaction is guaranteed to fit within a service boundary. So we've sort of addressed the transaction problem that we, we sort of have to deal with in a microservice architecture. So that, that's, you know, a huge benefit. Not only that, the, this sort of transaction scope actually fits the capabilities of a typical NoSQL database, right? So in a NoSQL database, you can only update, say, a, a single document or a single row or a single key value pair. So if, for instance, we persist uh, an aggregate as a Mongo document, then we're writing transactions that are only creating or updating a single Mongo document at a time. And so, you know, it, it's sort of a perfect fit at that level. Is that a burn? You have a burning question? That's coming up later. <laughs> yeah. So I, 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 have, I have intentionally narrowed the scope of what a transaction means, which I think as you're feeling this sort of discomfort, it doesn't necessarily match the actual business requirements that you might have. But I'm, I'm doing that to create suspense, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> so, in, interestingly, there, there is this issue around, like, how big are your aggregates? Because, you know, in order for something to, be gen to actually be atomic, right, like the unit of atomicity in this programming model is now the aggregate. So if there is something that so happens to need to be, ag needs to be truly atomic, and it turns out that many, many things don't need to be atomic, but if they do, then what you need to update within that transaction has to fit within a single aggregate. And it turns out that you often get to choose your aggregate boundaries. So I, I for instance, had been saying that orders, customers, and products were their own separate aggregates, but that's a design decision that I consciously made. You could, for example, put customers, products, and orders all within the same aggregate. So your system just consists of a single aggregate. And I actually talked with someone who tried to do this, with some startup in the Bay Area, because they wanted consistency, right? Turns out that it was terrible and it, and it did not work. But, yeah, but something that could work would be to have a customer and their orders be an aggregate, right? So, you could imagine you know, a large MongoDB, MongoDB document containing a customer and all of their orders, and that would be a single aggregate, and product would be another aggregate, and that could possibly be a legitimate way of, of implementing your application if there was something that you needed to implement, a transaction that needed to be atomic, and in, you know, that involved customers and all of their orders. But of course, there's a, there's a drawback is that the you can only update a single aggregate at a time, right? Updates are serialized when it, updates of, a, of the same aggregate are serialized and that can result in bad usability and a bad user experience. Like when two orders, two users try and edit the same order for a different customer, the second one might actually not be able to save their changes because of like an optimistic locking exception. So there's sort of problems there. So in general, it's better to have 
um, as fine-grained aggregates as possible. Um, but, but you do have a choice. So, that, so, that, so that's one, that's a partial answer to how do you make things atomic. But if you want to um, sort of solve this problem more generally, um, you actually have to use an alternative approach, which I'm going to talk about, not, right, talk about next. So yeah, so let, let's imagine that, you know, orders and customers, you had, you know, orders, right, and you've got, and they belong to a customer, customers have a credit limit, and we need to always ensure that this credit limit is never exceeded. So if, as I showed, if they're in the same database, same monolithic application with a monolithic database, trivial, right? But if they're separate aggregates belonging in separate services, and you can't use two-phase commit, it's like, how the heck do you maintain consistency? Or in this case, how do we reliably enforce this, this business rule or, or, or invariant? And it turns out the solution is to use events. So we're actually going to abandon this sort of acid model and go to an eventually consistent event-driven model. And the idea, which is really quite simple, is that a service publishes an event whenever it updates one of its aggregates. Actually, strictly speaking, you could imagine the a an aggregate when its state changes actually publishes the event. But um, you can think of this happening at a service level. So whenever something changes or something of note occurs, you publish an event. Another service subscribes to those events and then reacts accordingly, can update its own state. So in order... and in order to sort of maintain some consistency. So the way this would work with order processing is as follows. So a request comes in to create an order. The order service would create an order, but sort of in this pending state, like, well, it hasn't been verified yet. It would publish an event to say that the order has been created. That would get consumed by the customer service, which would perform the credit check. It would actually, in this case, in the example code, it actually updates the customer or attempts to update the customer to reserve the credit for that order. And then it will publish an event which indicates the outcome of that credit check. Either a customer or either a credit reserved event would be published if, it was, if the credit was able to be reserved or if the credit limit was exceeded, it would publish a credit check failed event. The order, so the order service would process one or other of those events and then update the order in some way, either approve the order or reject it because there was insufficient credit. So in this, so, that, so that's how you'd implement something like um, um, credit check without using ACID transactions. So, of course, in this case, instead, instead of one big transaction, there's actually a series of there's three transactions, one in the order service, one in the customer service, and then one back in the customer service. Uh, and they're, they're driven by events, or at least the, all but the first one is driven by events. So here's a slightly different view of this, right? So create order gets invoked, the order gets created, an event gets published, that get, the event gets consumed by the customer service, which updates the order, sorry, updates the customer with the credit reservation. It then publishes an event to say that the credit's been reserved, that event gets consumed, which then changes the state of the order, which then in turn could publish another event which could trigger fulfillment and, and so on. So that, that's how you implement sort of or maintain data consistency in a microservice architecture um, using events. So we've sort of abandoned the ACID model and we, we're now using this eventually consistent model which some, which some people call base, right? Basically available soft state eventually consistent. Um, and one thing you might note is, gosh, this is now a bit complicated, right? Like, you know, in a more general case, you, you know, like in a 
sort of regular asset transaction, when a business rule gets violated, you can just simply roll back the transaction and, and all of the changes get undone, right? But in, the, in this model, you could have a long sequence of steps, and it was only when you got to the fifth step do you realize that some business rule would be violated, and you actually end up having to publish an event which would then next trigger the execution of these so-called compensating transactions, which would explicitly undo the changes that they had to make to, in the first four steps of this process. Um, so that, that's a bit complicated, and you have to carefully think about the design in order for this to work. You know, like if you're transferring money between two bank accounts, right, you debit the from account, and then when you try and credit the to account, you find that it has been closed, so you then have to credit the, the from account with the money that you just took out of it. But then you could have a problem because someone could have closed the from account and now you've got this money in limbo and sort of the bank wins, I guess. Um, so, so there's some, you know, so it, 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 but in reality, the real world works this way. I think if you work for a bank, then you probably know that you, the, Transact money doesn't tend to get transferred using acid transactions. Well, at least the last time I talked to someone who worked for a bank, that, that's what they said. Um, so so that, that's the approach. But in order for this to work, there's an interesting little problem. You have to be, a, in order for it to be reliable, you have to atomically, in a sort of transactional sense, update the database. So, for instance, insert an order and publish an event, right? You've got to do two things involving two different pieces of infrastructure, the database and the message broker, and they have to be done atomically because, for instance, if you update the database and then you fail to publish an event because the message broker was down or something like that, or you crash before you have a chance to publish the message, which is more likely, then the system is now in an inconsistent state. And what's really ironic is that the standard way of doing this would be to use a distributed transaction where you, you, know, you, you update the database and then you publish a message to a JMS message broker which participates in the same transaction. But for the reasons I mentioned earlier, two-phase commit is not an option. So we need a different way of ensuring that we can reliably publish events. So it's kind of funny, right? Like we decide, oh, monolith's too hard, so let's use microservices. And it turns out that once you go down the microservices route, there's a whole bunch of complexity with maintaining data consistency. Um, sometimes when I've given talks, people you know, long for their monolithic applications. Um, but, you know, but then monoliths have big problems. So it turns out that there's uh, several different strategies that you can use. Um, and in this talk, I'm going to focus on one of them called event sourcing, but there are others. So for instance, eBay used this to maintain data consistencies across um, different systems. So it, with the application events pattern, an application inserts an event into an event table. So in the database, you're actually basically treating a table, using a table as a message queue. So you update, say in this case, the order, and you insert an event into the order, into the event table, and that's just one ACID transaction. And then outside of that, there's another process that's polling the event table, pulling events out, and publishing, doing, doing something else, like right? in this case, publishing them. So that's an approach that eBay used um, and then there's others. So like LinkedIn, they actually tail the transaction log, the database commit log or transaction log, and publish events based on that. Um, and that which is a really, really interesting technology. But the one I want to talk about is event sourcing. And if, oh, by the way, if you go to learnmicroservices.io, you'll find a link to an article that talks about these different approaches. Also on microservices.io, which is where these patterns live, you'll, you'll find a write-up for most of this as well. Um, but what I want to talk about is, is event sourcing, which is a particular way of writing your 
business logic that really is all about events. In fact, event sourcing is an event-centric way of persisting your data. And so in a way, the application isn't updating the database and, and sort of publishing an event. It actually, the, in, the basically, the, there is this concept of an event store that is kind of like a database and a message broker all rolled into one. And so whenever something changes, that state change ends up, all you're doing is publishing an event into the event store. Um, so it's a very event-centric way of storing your data, and uh, the details of which will become obvious in, in a minute. And the way that works is as follows. So for each of your aggregates, you identify the state-changing events. There are also ev or the domain events, to be more precise, which might be state changing, but they could be other things of significance, like uh, the credit limit was exceeded event, which wasn't a state change to the customer, but it just represents the, an, a, a failed attempt to violate a business rule. So you identify that the, any events are relevant. And what's interesting is there's, also, there's actually a, a workshop format where you gather, called event storming, where you gather people in a room and you brainstorm what the events are within a particular domain. And you, and you use that to actually design your, your business logic. But you figure out what your events are and then you define event classes. So events become first class citizens in your domain model. So in, in the order system, you would actually have classes like order created, order canceled, order shipped, order approved, and so on. So that's the first thing. You, you, you sort of treat events as first class citizens and model them explicitly. And then the second thing you do, which is really different, is that you change how you persist your domain objects. So the standard way, of course, is to take an order entity and you'd map it using JPA, Hibernate, or just straight SQL to a row in an order table. Right? That's sort of the standard way that we've been persisting our domain objects you know, from the beginning of time, or at least ever since relational databases were invented. Right? Um, but with this model, with event sourcing, you don't do that. You don't do this straightforward mapping. And instead, what you do is persist the events themselves. So, Conceptually and possibly in practice, if you were using a relational database, you would have an event table. That would be the entirety, almost, of your, your, your database schema because every state change ends up causing an event in this t to be inserted into this table. So when an order is created, all you do is save an order created event in this table. Likewise, when it's approved, you would insert an event to indicate that fact. And likewise, when it's shipped, you'd insert another event. And this is all you store for a given order, just the sequence of events. Um, so there are no other tables. The order table goes away. The order line item goes away. And you could imagine that the event data column is a blob of JSON, just for the sake of argument, because um, that's sort of just kind of a serialization of some bit of data. And then, when you want the current state of an order, right, like you think about, I want to load the order entity, so JPA slash Hibernate is going to issue a set of queries and, and reconstitute an order object in memory. In this system, what happens, it, it, you actually query the event table, load the events for a given order, or whatever entity it is you're loading, and then you replay those events to reinitialize what a, a blank order object. Um, and so you're basically taking the stream of events, collapsing them together in order to reconstitute this order entity. And yeah, if you have lots of events, there's a technique known as snapshotting that sort of means that you don't have to go back to the beginning of time and load the, order, and load the orders. If you're functionally inclined, you can think what you're doing in order to reconstruct the current state 
is a functional fold or, or a reduce over the stream of event. So that, that's the essence of event sourcing. You're storing the event and nothing else. The, the, the events are the system of record in, in your architecture. So your application now looks like this, where you've got this event store. You know, each aggregate is now represented in the event store as a sequence of events. Um, and so the order aggregates are owned and entirely private to the order service. The customer aggregate is owned and entirely private to the customer service. But they can actually subscribe to events that one another publish. So, so that, that's how you get the event-driven architecture here. And then the way requests get handled are as follows. So imagine a request comes in to the order service. First thing you have to do is find the events for that order, right? So it's a select against the event table, if that's how you're storing the events. You instantiate a new order using the default constructor. You apply the events that you loaded from the database to reinitialize the order. Later on, you'll see that, that an aggregate in this model has an apply method that takes an event and updates its current state. You then process the request, which gets represented by a command object. So aggregates have a process method that takes a command to say, do this, like reserve credit doesn't actually change the state of the domain object, but what it does, it returns a sequence of events that represents the state change. Those events are then applied to actually perform the state change, and then the, events are, the new events are saved in the event store, so appended onto the events table that, um, that's storing the events. And this is done with optimistic locking to handle the scenario where two requests are simultaneously trying to update the same order. So that's, that's one part of request processing. So that sort of, in a, you know, how an order would be canceled or, uh, or, or so on, or marked as shipped or, or whatever. The other part of it is that services like the customer service can subscribe to the event. So, so the event store has a subscription API. And then when those events are saved in the event store, interested subscribers are notified. So they would get the event. So it's sort of kind of like a message broker in that regard. So the customer service would get the event, the order event, whatever that would be. And that would then cause the order service to then go and update the, the customer for that order, if it made, you know, made sense for that particular event, which would then, of course, result in some customer event being saved in the event store, which would then trigger some other event handler in some other service. So that's sort of how this event, how event sourcing fits in with the event-driven architecture. You can have other subscribers that perform arbitrary actions, right? So when events, when they get notified of an event, an event subscriber could update a view. There's, there's a related pattern called command query responsibility segregation, where in order for, to facilitate easy querying or to support queries, you maintain a denormalized view of the data. So that, that view would be kept up to date by subscribing to events. So a great example of that would be using Elasticsearch, for instance, right? You want to add text searching onto your system where you simply subscribe to the stream of events that are being published by your aggregates and re-index the documents inside Elasticsearch. Other subscribers could send out notifications like emails or text messages or mobile push, et cetera. So sort of, you know, that you can do fairly arbitrary things. So the event store itself really is like part database because it has an API for inserting events for a given entity and also retrieving events for a given entity by primary key. So that's very database-like. And the database portion could be, you know, a SQL database, could be a NoSQL database. 
But then there's also a message broker type API as well, where you can subscribe to events that have been saved in the database. So some people, so it's kind of a hybrid database message broker. Some people have implemented it themselves on top of like MySQL or Postgres. Off in .NET land, there's a dedicated event store called Event Store or Get Event Store. Um, and then my startup's work, part of what we're building is an, is an event store as well. So there's various different ways of sort of building this, um, build, building an event store. So event sourcing, you know, has various benefits, right? Like it solves the data, you know, it lets you build an event-driven architecture that solves these data, that supports this notion of aggregate-based development. So you can easily maintain consistency between microservices or more specifically between aggregates. You know, <clears throat> every state change results in an event. Those events could be consumed by machine learning algorithms. They could be turned into notifications that get sent out to users. Um, this, it also eliminates OR mapping um, issues as well um, because we're no longer saving domain objects in the database. We're saving events, which generally are easy, easier to serialize. Also, because we're reifying at state changes, in other words, every state change is represented by an event object, it means that we have this built-in, 100% reliable audit logging mechanism. Right, like, you know, systems I worked in on the past where it was like, oh, we got to implement audit logging and we just kind of sprinkled calls to some audit logging service throughout our code. And sometimes it was reliable, sometimes not, right? Whereas this, it's guaranteed to be reliable because you, a state change by definition is an event in the event store, which is quite good. And then another benefit is, well, because you're saving the history of every domain object, you can actually go back in time and execute temporal queries and find, well, what's the state of this domain object two weeks ago, which can be useful if you need to sort of do diagnosis or the regulators want to know how you've executed trades, for example, right? You've got history that's accurate built in with this. So that, that's pretty powerful. Um, and then also, because you've preserved the history of everything that has happened in the entire system, in theory, all the way back to day one, you could actually implement a feature today that sort of, say this feature, this module is analyzed, sort of analyzes the stream of events and could, for instance, build up a view, but it could sort of do interesting analytics. You could actually have it process all of the events that have ever been published in your system since day one and the effect of that would be as if you had implemented that feature on day one, right? Um, whereas normally it's like if you implement it today and deploy it today, it can only sort of do things going forward. So now you've, got, you've sort of got a time machine that enables you to go back and implement features you know, as if they were done on day one. But having said that, you know, there are a bunch of drawbacks, right? Like, so it requires an application rewrite. You know, the way you write your domain logic, you've, the way you persist your data is very different. Though it does tie in nicely with the migration to microservices, right? So you migrate your code from a monolith using traditional JPA to a microservice architecture that's based on event sourcing, right? It sort of could fit in easily with that. That, you know, there's unda undoubtedly a learning curve, right? You're, you're programming in a different style. So there's, you know, that takes a little bit of getting used to. Another really interesting thing is that events never go away, right? So, I mean, kind of a joke saying it's a historical record, right? Which hopefully will not, hopefully you won't make bad design decisions with your events, but there are some serious issues around, you know, evolving the schema of your events, like adding new attributes over time that you need to be, you need to consider because once you have saved an event in your event store, consumers might, you know, might have to process 
might always have to be able to deal with events with that particular structure for forever. So you need some discipline. Also, you just you you. But in general, you can also plug in some like di effectively kind of take a version one event and upgrade it to a version two event when you load it in. So it, so your domain objects can always be written in terms of the latest event. So there are, there are things that you can do there, but there's, there's some interesting challenges. There's also an issue that this is a message-based system, and so you know, consumers might see the same event multiple times, and so in some situations, you're going to have to do some careful coding in order to detect and ignore duplicate events. Um, so that, that that can be a challenge. Usually the solutions are quite simple though. And then there's another problem. Querying the event store um, is not exactly straightforward. So you know, imagine that you want to find you want to find all orders that are, say, in a particular state, right? Not in sort of a traditional schema, you just go select from orders where state equals x, right? And you will find the, order, the rows that match. But now, I mean, it's, this is a really simple query, but in, actual, in order to figure out what the current state of an order is, you'd actually have to go find the events for that order and actually sort of discard all but the last event that corresponded to a state change for that order. Right? So in this case, yeah, you'd have like where and then some nested select equals the desired state, right? But you could Im easily imagine that a more complex query against the event store would just become incredibly complex and potentially inefficient. Um, so there's some sort of real problems there. And also, some event stores only. S specifically ones that are based up with, on top of NoSQL databases only support lookup of events by primary key, so you have no ability to actually execute queries anyway. And so that's why, as I mentioned earlier, you need to use CQRS, Command Query Responsibility Segregation, and maintain separate views in order to support your queries. But that, that's sort of a whole other topic. Um, but it, does, it turns out that in general, CQRS has value anyway, right? Like it's just a generalization of having using like Elasticsearch in order to support text queries. It's just you end up having to use these secondary stores in order in order to support any kind of query in your application, except for the load this entity by primary key kind of queries. Um, that's a whole other topic. Okay, so I just want to finish up by quickly talking about, well, showing some example code um, for, for this sort of order and customer's use case. So there's, in the actual application, which you, you can find in GitHub, there's actually three services. There's the customer service that has the customer aggregate. There's the order service that has the order aggregate. And then there's actually an order history service that's implementing one of these denormalized views. So it's a CQRS view, and it's actually using MongoDB. And internally, for each customer, there is a MongoDB document which has an, at, an orders attribute that is the collection of the orders for that particular customer. And, that, and MongoDB is kept up to date by subscribing to events. So that, that's sort of the big picture view of the application. If you dig down into the customer service, right, like, yeah, there's a customer controller. The, the domain logic consists of a customer service, the customer, oh, yeah, the customer aggregate, and then there's some event handlers that are subscribing to the order events that are being published through um, via another service. And the system actually is using Kafka as well, because um, there's some other communication between the order. So the order service is actually publishing events, or sorry, the customer service is publishing event, some other event or some other messages, I should say, 
that it get consumed by the order service via Kafka as well as the event store. But that's sort of out. Um, you can look at the code later. So here's the customer aggregate. So it's got some state. It's got a field that's a credit limit. It also has credit reservations that's a field that's a map from order ID to money. So it's keeping track of the fact that order 1234 has reserved $1,200 of the available credit. There are also a set of process methods. So those are the ones that take a command which represents a, requ a request to do something to a customer, like create the customer or reserve credit. And they return a list of events. So they don't do, the commands don't perform a state change. They return events that represent the, the state change. There are also apply methods that take an event and perform the state change. So there's a very sort of structured way of writing um, the business logic. And in essence, if you think about it, so in the old way of writing code, you'd have a reserve credit method that took some parameters, sort of used some, implemented some like business rules, and then did a state update. In this model, that method is split into two. It's split into a process method that's doing some sort of biz implementing the business rules and then returning an event representing the state change. And then the state change is handled by an apply method um, that takes the event and just updates state. So it's sort of the same business logic. We've just split it into two. So here's the aggregate itself. So it implements reflect. So yeah, it implements um, a base class called reflective mutable command processing aggregate. Um, so it's sort of like f following the spring naming convention. But it's, it makes sense because it's an aggregate that knows how to process commands. And it's mutable because you can, un, uh, if I was programming in Scala, I'd have immutable aggregates. But this is Java, so I'm, I'm mutating them. So they're mutable. And it's actually using reflection to dispatch on the event type and the command type to the appropriate apply method or process method. So that, that's, if you, that's, that's the explanation. You know, I've unpacked the name for you. Um, so the pro process methods, you know, there's a couple of those. The second one, the process method that takes a reserve credit command is, is the interesting one because that has one line of business logic in it, right? So it's saying if the available credit is greater than or equal to the order total, then return the credit reserve, credit, customer credit reserved event. So we've, we've reserved, we, there is credit for us to reserve. But then if there isn't sufficient credit, it returns a customer credit limit exceeded event, which is there's a typo in that. So that, that's, a, you know, that's a great example of, some, of, a, of a method that implements a business rule. And then if we look at the apply method, th those are really simple, right? So the corresponding customer credit reserved event apply method just puts an entry into the map of credit reservations. So that, that's that one there. So there's no business logic in the apply methods. There's that, you know, what to do has already been decided by the process methods. The apply methods simply apply the change. And, that, and I should have mentioned, those are used when reconstructing the current state of an, of, of an aggregate um, when loading it from the event store. So oh, and the other one that's interesting is when the customer credit limit is exceeded, that's not in, indic indicative of a state change. It's indicative of a business rule violation. So the apply method doesn't actually do anything. Um, you know, here's the controller that handles the post request to create a new customer. So it's just calling the create customer method on the customer service. And here's the customer service. So the create method is just one liner. 
Um, and that's because it's written using this helper class known as called aggregate repository. That has a save method which takes a command. So in this case, it's a create customer command. And what save does is create a, you know, a, a customer aggregate using its default constructor, processes the command by calling the process method, applies the events by calling apply, and then it saves the events in the event store. So that whenever you need to you know, create a new aggregate, you, you would repeat those four steps over and over again. So the save method just kind of like encapsulates that boilerplate for you. So it, things end up being, you know, what you write ends up being really simple. So that, that's the service. Here's an event handler. So it's annotated with at event subscriber. Um, and that actually tr ends up being picked up by a Spring Bean post processor, which then ends up subscribing to the event store using the subscription name that, that's passed in. And then you can see there's one event handler method that handles the order created event. And remember, the, so when an order created event is received, what it has to do is tell the customer to reserve the credit. So that's, um, so that's, that's what the event handler does. And it's calling the update method on the context that gets passed in. And this is like the save method. It's a helper method that simplifies how you interact with the event store. So what it's doing is so it's saying, you know, you, you tell update, go find the customer, find a customer with the specified customer ID and process the reserve credit command. And so under the covers, it's actually loading the customer, processing the command, applying the events, and saving those new events in the event store. So it's just sort of encapsulating that piece of boilerplate code. And then there's some, there's some ugly code here, which it's like, so this code's written in a reactive style and using Java 8 completable futures, which have a hideous API, if you ask. Well, it's the, well at least they're useful, but the names of the methods are all just wrong. Um, like handle async should really be called flat map, or if you are, or actually even better, it needs a recover with method if you're familiar with Scala. But basically what this is doing is handling the scenario where an order was created with an invalid customer ID. So there's no actual aggregate to go in the database, so you get an entity not found exception. And this piece of code here is actually recovering from that by using Spring Cloud Stream to send a message back to the order service saying, you tell, told me to reserve credit for this customer, but this customer doesn't exist, which would then cause the order, order to be canceled. And that, so Spring Cloud Streams is actually publishing a message via Kafka. So there's sort of this secondary event-based sort of back channel that, that's being used here. Um, and that's all abstracted away in this. Go, you, know, you go online and you can see the, the, the code for its, um, in all its ugly details. So, um, so that, that's actually pretty much my talk. So in summary, right, so aggregates really are the building blocks of your business logic in your microservice-based applications. And in general, it's like, go read the domain-driven design book because there's so many concepts in there aggregates and also the, the strategic design concepts like bounded contexts that are incredibly applicable to microservices architecture. You want to use events to maintain consistency between your aggregates or between your services. And event sourcing is a really good way to implement an, an event-driven architecture. So, that, you know, so that's my talk. Thank you for listening, and I hope that you found it useful. And here's all my contact information. So thank you. And I, I guess there's time for questions if you, think, if you don't want to go to the bar right away. Um, yeah. Uh, I changed my mind. Let's go to the bar. <laughs> yeah.
Oh, that's a really good question, yes. Yeah. So what do I use for the event store? Um, so, that I actually, so I actually have two answers for that. So, um, so if you go to eventuate.io, so one, there's a, there's a hosted version. So that's actually leveraging features of AWS to provide the event store. Um, but within the next week or so, I'm actually releasing an open source version that you can run on premise that's just going to leverage um, a, a SQL database in Kafka. Um, yeah. 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 Um, yeah. So the, so sort of yeah. So for the recording, yeah. The question is, well, if you're sort of refactoring an existing monolith, what what which what approach could you use, right, for in order to publish events? Um, and so yeah, you ha you have a choice. Um, so one is, you, well, it's like number one, you almost always need to do something, especially because integrating a monolith with a microservice, you almost need events going back and forth in order to keep data synchronized. So that, that's part, so, you, so it's like you need to do something. And then, yes, there are different patterns that you can apply. Um, and I think, say, transaction log tailing is too problematic because you're seeing low-level changes to the database schema, and you have to reverse engineer what the business events are. So let's you know, rule that one out. Um, so then the next thing is, well, should I use event sourcing, or should I use application events? And you know, it's, part of it is sort of what, what your, it's like either one will work, right? Part of it is sort of what your preference is. And then also, by the time, if you're going to use e events anyway, you, on top of a relational database, you, use, might not, you might end up discovering that using event sourcing is pretty straightforward, actually. Hang on, this is a spring conference. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. There you can kind of already use out of the box the whole idea of events, the whole idea of getting the persistence in a way that you actually describe that it's trying to be. Like many of the things that you may do yourself. Yeah. So, so the question is, um, yeah, if you were doing a greenfield project, well, w w would I use Acker? Um, and once again, that's an interesting question. Uh, on the one hand, say the the you know Light Ben, formerly known as TypeSafe po folks, have a quite interesting stack. What you know, what what I would what, what I would I, I like actors, and I like using actors within services. What I'm less comfortable doing is using actors as sort of the organizing paradigm for an entire system, right? I'd feel much better using sort of more open and, and, and somewhat less proprietary technologies than, say, like actor remoting, for example. You know, you know what I mean? Um, Plus, this is a spring conference, and we love spring here, don't we? <laughs> um, actually, I'm told that I'm out of time, but I'll take your question offline. So once again, thank you for listening, and I hope you found this useful. <laughs>